Good afternoon. First, let me um, thank Fordham University, the Orthodox Study Center, all the uh, organizers of this symposium for inviting me. Let me um, state from the beginning that uh, this presentation has its formative aspects that come from discussions with uh, parishioners at Holy Trinity Cathedral. I had um, a series of discussions on the Mistagogia. So um, through those discussions, a foundation was laid, and later on I was able to develop this concept of shaped theology. The paper is divided into four sections. The first is architect as theologian. The second is sacred space and liturgical movement. The third is sacred space and liturgy as Trinitarian and Christological presence. And the fourth is sacred space and liturgy, the context for renewing and deifying creation. Needless to say, Maximus is not easy to read, and uh, I can't promise that um, this paper will be easy to listen to. But let's <laughs> get it the architect as theologian. Given the scope of this symposium, I believe that the mystical here of Maximus the Confessor challenges the modern architect to create a shape, a form, a building that expresses the theology of the Orthodox Church in both an urban and rural setting. Anyone familiar with the Mistagogia knows that for Maximus, architecture combined with the divine liturgy form a theological statement. Like the lines and color of an icon, the shape of sacred space together with the liturgical action taking place within it form a symphony of theology. This symphony or symbiotic relationship is not accidental. For Maximus, the symbiosis of architecture and liturgy, the vertical, horizontal, and curved line shaping sacred space are essential components for visualizing and understanding the inherent movement of the liturgy as a theological and soteriological experience. These architectural components assist in placing a person and or community occupying the church structure into the ever-expanding contours of the liturgy as a local and cosmic event in which one is invited to encounter and to be embraced by the inexhaustible richness of the church's theology. The lines of sacred space and the liturgical movement within it are understood by Maximus as both image of God and image of the cosmos. We will look more closely at this in due course. For now, two questions for the architect to wrestle with are, can the shapes of God and cosmos be achieved architecturally outside the Byzantine and Slavic canons along with their derivatives? If so, then what will these shapes look like? I strongly believe that by becoming familiar with some of the theological aspects of space and liturgy presented in the mystical Gia, the modern architect has offered creative insights and challenges for, divine, for designing new shapes inspired by those of the past that articulate and actualize the living theology of liturgical worship, particularly the celebration of the divine liturgy sacred space, and liturgical movement. It is not uncommon to compare the division of sacred space with that of the Jerusalem temple. Yet contrary to the popular piety that too often prevails in the Orthodox Church, the sacred space of the Christian edifice is not a mere copy of the old temple. This is especially seen contrasting the organization of space and the function of the curtain within the Jerusalem temple with the space and movement described by Maximus. As Margaret Barker points out, the veil of the temple represented the boundary between the visible world and the invisible, between time and eternity. Actions performed within the veil were not of this world, but were part of the heavenly liturgy. 
This is not the case in the mystical here. While for Maximus, the choreography or movement taking place within the nave and sanctuary maintained the distinctions between heaven and earth while differentiating clergy from laity, the movement within the sacred space also emphasized their unity. As Thomas Matthews points out, the non-Syrian churches during the time of Maximus, that's the seventh century, had neither an iconostasis nor curtain. Along with the table of oblation located outside the sanctuary and the absence of pews, the Mistovokia offers the modern architect possibilities for creating a space that affirms the unity of heaven and earth as it joins clergy and laity together as co-celebrants of the Eucharist. Maximus asserts this unity and interdependency by describing the church building as a microcosm that unites heaven and earth. He writes, the Holy Church of God is itself a symbol, a symbol of, of the sensible world, possessing on the one hand the divine sanctuary as heaven and the well-ordered beauty of the nave as the earth. Similarly, the world exists as the church, having on the one hand the heavens for sanctuary and the order which exists upon the earth for the nave. Given this unity, it can be affirmed, inferred that there is the accompanying unity of time and eternity, history and eschatology, while maintaining their distinctive qualities. For Maximus, the church building and its liturgy are a re revelation of unity in diversity and diversity in unity. I need not go into at least now the, the loaded term diversity and the uh, challenges it presents to the Orthodox Church. He describes this dynamic by referring to the movement between nave and altar, culminating in the reception of the Eucharist. Here Maximus maintains that while the spatial components of the church building are diverse, there remains nonetheless one structure, one hypostasis, that gathers and unites clergy and laity into the one household and kingdom of God. He writes, for the building is one according to the hypostasis, not being divided by the parts which comprise it due to the differences of the parts. But by the offering, the parts themselves become one within it, showing that each of the two is freed of the differences derived from their designated names. There is an exchange of properties from one to the other. Each one retaining its properties becomes the other, each being the same as the other. The sanctuary potentially, katakin dinami, becomes the nave by the priestly offering of the sacrament, and in return the nave becomes the sanctuary. According to the spatial activity taking place within each, which originates from the sacrament, one results from two, while each possesses the same property. For Maximus, the diversity within sacred space does not impede its unity or oneness. This is due to the unifying action of the consecration of the gifts occurring within the sanctuary. Consequently, the name is what it is because of its relationship with the sanctuary, while the sanctuary is what it is because the consecration occurring within it completes the name. Neither space exists on its own. Each is dependent upon the other. And by using the Aristotelian concept of potentiality, Maximus attempts to show how the interpenetration of nave and sanctuary also allows for the interpenetration of history and eschatology. Within this movement of space and time, the destiny of humanity unfolds. For Maximus, this occurs through the gifts of the Holy Spirit culminating in the reception of the Eucharist. He writes, through participation of the holy, undefiled, and life-giving mysteries, it is possible for the one who draws near 
to share through likeness both communion and identity, through which the human person is deemed worthy as a human being to become God. To better appreciate these basic liturgical actions and accompanying theology, one needs to understand that for Maximus, liturgical movement engages not only the body, but also the mind. In other terms, the understanding of architecture and liturgical movement for Maximus has a tropological quality. They invite one into a tropos, or manner of existence, tropos hypoxios, that allows for the transformation of body and mind. Here, Maximus emphasizes the need for contemplation, theoria, from which emerges the vision of God as well as the vision of humanity and cosmos. Consequently, the area for Maximus is a psychosomatic endeavor that immerses the mind and body into the crucible of asceticism that unveils the acts and movements within sacred space as both ascent and descent. As such, the entrance of the synapses, with the reading of the gospel, the offering of the gifts, and approaching the altar to receive the Eucharist are the simultaneous ascent of a body and intellect seeking in proportion and analogia to their abilities, union with God who descends from on high. Sacred space and liturgy as Trinitarian and Christological presence. For Maximus, the combined beauty of architectural form and its accompanying liturgy reveal and accomplish what cannot be achieved in nature or the realm of what resides outside the church structure. For this reason, Maximus sees the church building as both the imprint and image of God, as well as the imprint and image of the world as it was intended to be. Unity in diversity and diversity in unity have Trinitarian and Christological foundations in which structure, space, and ritual express the very characteristics of God. Together with the renewed eschatological vision of creation brought out in the Mystagogia, the modern architect is challenged to create a space that together with its liturgy invites one into the very existence of God where the visible and invisible, the created and uncreated, the sensible and intelligible, the temporal and eternal are brought into a renewed and transfigured union without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. Within the sacred space, everyone and everything maintain their uniqueness while entering a new manner of existence, tropos hypoxios, in which they are deified. It would not be an exaggeration to state that for Maximus, the reality of unity and diversity and diversity and unity within the Trinity is visualized or concretized in the incarnation of the Logos. All that relates to the Trinity and therefore all the mysteries of divine life and activity prior to and following the incarnation have their beginning, meaning, and purpose in Christ. In Ambiguum 42, Maximus himself states, the mystery of Christ, Tocata Mysterion, is the most mysterious of all the divine mysteries. He is the limit of all conceivable perfection, and he himself exceeds all limits. As Rene Bordner points out, the divine mystery is exteriorized in Christ who is the summary of all the mysteries. This idea is captured by Gregory of Nyssa and reverberates throughout the mystical gear. Gregory writes about Christ being both uncreated and created tabernacle. He says tabernacle, the tabernacle would be Christ who is the power and wisdom of God who in his own nature was not made with hands, 
and capable of being made when it became necessary for this tabernacle to be created among us. Thus, the same tabernacle is in a way both unfashioned and fashioned, uncreated in pre-existence, but created in having received this material composition. Maximus, I would say, takes Gregory's uncreated, created Christology a step further. Because the church building is one hypostasis, uniting the uncreated and created, and because it is the image of God and the image of the cosmos, it is not a parallel reality to a heavenly or ideal archetype. On the contrary, the rich language Maximus uses at the very beginning of the mystical year, terms such as shape, peoples, image, ikon, and copy or imitation, mimesis, refer to the church and its liturgy as bearing the same presence and activity of God in whom everyone and everything become one in the incarnate Logos. Sacred space and liturgy in the context for renewing and deifying creation. <laughs> Sacred space and liturgy are not copies, but the real presence and activity of the divine. As the image of God and the image of the world, the church building becomes for Maximus the manifestation and context of the transfigured and deified creation. This is so because the topography of the church, its exterior and interior, are inseparable from God himself. Adam Cooper describes this basic concept of the mystogogia by stressing that because topos is joined to eschatology, it is, as he says, ultimately equated with God himself, since it refers to that space filled in the age to come by Christ's own incarnate complement, the church, a body the locals penetrates entirely. From a Christological perspective, <coughs> sacred space and liturgy affirm the incarnation of the Logos. Thus, for Maximus, the word of God, very God, wills that the mystery of his incarnation be actualized always in all things. Jordan Wood emphasizes how these words from Ambiguum 7 have protological and eschatological dimensions. They simultaneously point to God creating ex nihilo and God's perfection or deification of the world. Both creation and deification are inextricably united to Christ the Logos. Maximus uses bold and provocative language when he describes receiving the Eucharist. The communicant is given, he writes, fellowship, identity, and participation in the likeness of God. These terms, while expressing unity and diversity and diversity and unity, also point to the community as possessing the same activity as God. Given this, the modern architect has the opportunity to create a structure and space that allow the liturgy to show itself as God's work in and for the life of the world. The modern architect has the opportunity to create what Fletcher Christian calls animate architecture. And Fletcher Christian is not Captain Wise nemesis. He's an architect. <laughs> For those who are wondering. We can apply this attractive term to a shape and space that allow the liturgy to reveal the church building as extending beyond itself, as it ingests into itself all the diverse components of the cosmos that exist outside its given parameters. The extending out and drawing in is the ongoing dynamic of Pentecost, whereby those gathered within the church building, together with all that comprises the church edifice, have the potential to overcome all division and polarities by becoming identical to Christ, who is all and in all. Thank you.